Hi, this video describes the user interface of our Scout and Code software package. I use Code in order to demonstrate everything, but uh, mainly everything that I show you here is also available in Scout. When you start the software, it looks like, th like this. You see a, a kind of picture in the background, some text elements, and I will now show you in the next uh, basically 20 minutes, I think, um, how to configure code in order to compute reflectance and transmittance of a glass plate and show the spectrum on, uh, on, this, on the screen. Uh, before I go into, into details concerning the optical part, I will like to show you the user interface and some useful keyboard commands, um, uh, which are special to code and which are not very common to other Windows programs. What you see here is the so-called main view, the shiny surface of code, which shows only a few items which are necessary for a certain solution. Uh, behind this level is a second level called the tree view level, which contains uh, access to all the details of the program. In the main view, uh, there are some keyboard commands that are used to hide and show different parts of the program. Uh, let's, let's start at the top where you have the typical Windows menu. Um, if you want to hide that, you just press the, key, uh, the, the, the keyboard key M for a menu and it disappears. And pressing M again, it comes back. Uh, this applies to several parts of the, of the program. The, on the second line here, you have a, a so-called button panel uh, with some uh, fast buttons for, for quick actions. You can hide the button panel pressing B on your keyboard. And if you press B again, it comes back. So pressing M hides and shows the menu. Pressing B hides and shows, hides and shows uh, the, the button panel. There's a status bar at the bottom, which is not visible right now, but it comes up pressing the key S on your keyboard for status bar. Uh, that contains some additional control em elements and information that will be discussed later. Hiding the status bar is done by pressing S again. Okay, there's a, a double click on the main uh, view that you should recognize. A double click opens another panel, another button panel to the right. This has been introduced for people using a touch screen without any keyboard. And here you find keyboard commands that you can execute with your fingers on a touch panel uh, without a real keyboard. Um, a, do a double click hides this again. Uh, so every action hides and shows with the same command. So if you are missing something, just click or press the right key to, to bring it up. An important key is the uh, key that brings the software into a so-called presentation mode. That hides the, the frame and the control and the Windows control elements. So if I press P, uh, code gets a frameless, becomes a frameless image that makes most sense if it's in full screen mode. So if I press P again and put code to full screen mode and press P once more, it looks a little bit like PowerPoint, but it's code just showing its main view without any further control elements. Pressing P again brings you back at least the frame so that you can move and resize the window and you know already pressing M and B and S shows the other elements and the double click brings back uh, the button panel to the to the right. So those are the, the most important uh, keyboard commands to, to be known uh, on the shiny main view level. Um, just a, a few remarks on the question mark here on some uh, you have um, about a menu command, which shows basically the object generation, that is the version number of code, 
and it gives you information about your license, uh, when it will expire, and when and for how long you can up, you can get free updates from our website. Uh, the configuration that was loaded um, has also uh, an object generation, and you can only load configurations which have the current object generation or are older. You cannot load uh, data files or configuration files saved in a future format, of course. Okay, that's the About box. Uh, there's another important section here, which is uh, online help. Uh, both the Scout online manual and the Code online manual are available here directly through shortcuts. So if you click, for example, on the Scout online manual, which has most of the information about the optical model, uh, you will be directed to a website which shows basically the whole documentation here uh, with all the details of the, of the program. Hide this. There's also um, a section called Things to Read on my website. Uh, which gives you basically access to all the documentation in various formats, uh, and there are some uh, basically some presentations that I gave in the past that you can access here. Usually, you will get a PDF file that you can read on on your screen on your screen. Okay, that was uh, basically the. The, com the comments I would like to make to the on the main view. Um, behind the scenes is the so-called tree view, and the tree view can be accessed using the keyboard command F7. So the function key 7, if you press the function key 7, the uh, program will switch to the tree view level, where you have here on the left side the, the tree view. Uh, basically consisting of several sub-branches. We will take a look at them uh, a little bit closer during this, uh, this course. And um, F7 brings you back to the main view. So in order to explain the philosophy behind the user interface, I would like to show you first um, how lists work in code. Uh, all the tree view branches here basically are lists of objects uh, which have a similar structure and similar functions. They are, of course, lists of different types of objects. And uh, the first list I would like to show you in detail is the list that determines what is drawn here on this user interface. The user interface is called main, or uh, this user's interface is called main view, and there's a branch here called views. Actually in code and scout you can have several views and you can easily switch between them. Um, usually there's only one view defined. In this case it's a view called start screen and uh, if we want to see what is the content of this list we have to double click it or we have to right click it and what you see here on the right basically is the content of the list. And um, it shows you various uh, objects. Every object is contained in one line of the list, and the objects have a name, some numbers here. I will explain that in a second. Uh, a property called source and the object type. And as you can guess already, a bitmap view will show a bitmap. Lines will show several lines of text, and so on. I will not discuss all the available types in this list. Uh, what I will discuss first is uh, the command delete all. That's more or less common to all lists in code. And if you apply this, it will delete all the objects. You have to be very careful doing this uh, because code and scout do not really have an undo function, which works completely perfect. So. If you delete all, all the objects are gone. Once these objects are gone in the list of view elements, uh, if you press F7, you see there's nothing drawn in the main view. 
because there is no object here which draws something in the main view. Um, let's generate some some objects uh, to practice uh, to populate the view with things that we can see. Um, in almost any list in Code and Scout, you will find a drop-down box. And the drop-down box gives you uh, access to a list of possible object types that you can generate. Here in the list of view elements, you have many objects that you can, uh, that you could generate, many types of objects. Uh, let's start with a very simple one called rectangle. Uh, if you click on this, you just have selected the type of object. There's no object created yet. Uh, with the plus sign now, you generate uh, an object of this type. Uh, you should give it a name. Let's call this R1 for rectangle 1. Uh, and let's see with F7 what this rectangle now shows. Well, no surprise, it shows a rectangle. Um, and what you can do now here in the main view uh, are some uh, adjustment uh, commands, which I will quickly show now, because they are very handy and practical and uh, easy to be used. So if there is a rectangle drawn here, basically you can move it around holding the shift key down on your keyboard. And while you hold the shift key down, you can move this object within the view. You can just take it with the mouse and move it somewhere else. So that's the repositioning by holding the shift key down and uh, moving the object with the mouse. If you hold two keys down, the shift key and the alt key, the ALT key, then you can drag the right end of this rectangle, the right edge or the bottom edge or the top edge individually, also the left one here. So this is basically repositioning and resizing in, in one step. So you can resize an object like this very easily, holding the Shift and Alt key down at the same time, and then use using the mouse. Third command, Third action to manipulate objects is the control key. If you hold the control key down and click on an object like this rectangle, you will um, basically send a command to this object, show me your properties. In this case, the rectangle shows us a color dialog, which is here on my windows in German. Uh, in your case, it will be in your window, Windows language. So obviously, this is a color dialog. You can select yellow, for example. If you click on OK, you will get another dialog, color dialog, which is for the frame of the object. We can leave this as black. And if we do this, we have a yellow rectangle that we can move and resize in this main view. Let's go back to the tree view level with F7. Here is our list of view elements with the one rectangle. The next command I would like to show you is called duplicate. With duplicate, we can um, duplicate an object. We get a one-to-one -one copy. So in order to avoid confusion, we should rename the object first. So we should call the second one R2. And if we press F7, uh, we just see one object because the object has been duplicated. It, it's drawn at the same position. So if we shift one of the objects to the side, now we see clearly two rectangles. Um, let's execute the control command and turn one rectangle into a light blue one. So now you can see the yellow one is drawn first. The light blue one is drawn on top of that covering part of the first object. And if we go back with F7, you can see that R1, that's the yellow one, is drawn first. And then R2, that's the blue one, is drawn in the second position uh, on top of it. If you want to change this role, you can use the little red arrows here, arrow buttons. You can select R2, move it up in the list, 
Uh, and now if you press F7, the blue one is drawn first and the yellow one is drawn on top of it. So you will find the little uh, red arrows in several lists, uh, for example in layer stacks, where it is important that you define the right sequence of objects. Okay, uh, our task here, of course, is not to um, generate um, a graph with two rectangles or doing some, some uh, more or less nice graphics. Uh, our task is to um, generate data of optical models, so to compute uh, optical spectra and do data analysis or design of optical properties of of uh, well your uh, thin film systems. So the next step is now to approach a configuration where we can see optical spectra in the main view, and I will now show you how to compute reflectance and transmittance of a, basically a piece of glass. So first, let's go back to the list of view elements with F7 and delete the two rectangles using the command delete all. And what I would like to have here is uh, a small kind of cosmetic uh, object, which is a color gradient in the background, which makes everything looks a little bit nicer. Uh, and actually, it, <laughs> this uh, is, can be used to explain you uh, at least what these numbers mean here. Left top width and height mean percentages of the left and top position of the object and the width and height. All uh, refer to the uh, width and height of the drawing area. So this is a color gradient which covers 50% of the height and of the, of the um, weight. If we put this to 100, we will get a color gradient that fills the, the full uh, background, and actually it would be nice to have a second one. You will later see why. Uh, I generate uh, a copy of this, but with a small width, let's say only 10% uh, of this, and uh, starting at 45% uh, on the left side. And uh, I would like to have a different color. This goes from gray to white. Uh, showing uh, this color gradient if we define something that goes from white to gray it should look like like this so we will we'll have or maybe I can make it a little bit wider using the shift out command that we have seen already so this will be displaying the layer stack later on. We will have the reflectance and transmittance spectra here and some other details on the left side. So we'll, this is just a kind of separator uh, for different parts uh, in, the, in the main view. Okay, let's now go to the, to the optical part. Um, I will use in this first demonstration of the user interface uh, optical constants material properties from uh, the built-in database. In the tree view, there's uh, an item called optical constant database, which contains a lot of predefined material properties. If we right-click that, we, you, you will see a long list, a few hundred elements of different materials. And I will just use glass from this database, uh, glass, is in the section starting with the letter G. So if I press G, I will get the first element with G, which is gallium arsenide. If I scroll down a little bit, there is a section with glass. My favorite glass model is this one, glass float glass model. And in order to make use of this object, I have to drag it to the list of materials here. This now has two elements. It had already a predefined object called vacuum, and now it has the new object called uh, glass, float glass model, and uh, I will find this object also in the tree view as a sub-branch, and if I right-click that, uh, I will 
show I will tell this object to to show itself in the right section here of the tree view and what the object does it shows uh, a quantity called refractive index which has a real and an imaginary part n plus ik the real part is the blue curve here the imaginary part is the red curve here and what we see here basically from 300 to 2500 nanometer wavelengths are the optical constants of glass which determine how light waves are reflected uh, at interfaces from glass to other materials and uh, how, how fast they move in this material and um, how much they are absorbed. Uh, actually, the meaning of refractive index values will be discussed in a, in a different video. Here, I will just show you uh, the real and imaginary part as it is shown here. You can just, that's a side remark now, you can also show uh, the dielectric function, which is basically the complex square of the refractive index, or you can show the intensity absorption coefficient, which gives you the decay of light waves, the, ex the exponent of the decay of light waves that traveling in this type of glass. Usually, you should look at the refractive index, uh, which is this one here. Okay, now we know everything that we have to know about the uh, light transport through glass. Uh, what we have to define now is that we want to that we want to consider a glass pane. Let's say a pane of four millimeter thickness, and we can do that in another list, which is called layer stacks. Uh, actually, Code and Scout can handle several layer stacks in one optical model. Um, there are some situations where you need more than one layer stack, but in most situations, you will only work with a single layer stack. There is one layer stack in this list of layer stacks predefined, which is this one here, which is called layer stack. It's the only one that we will use in this first example. If we right-click that, we will see uh, actually two tree views uh, on, the, on the left and right side of the layer stack definition, which is here in the middle. Um, the layer stack definition shows all the layers uh, underneath the top half space, which is vacuum, and the bottom half space, which is also filled with vacuum at the moment. In between, we should have our layer stack. Um, in most cases, we will work with two types of um, layers. One is called thin film, and the second type is called thick layer. Uh, I will also describe in a different, in a, in a separate video, the difference between these la layer stacks, uh, these types of layers. Sorry, uh, thick layer should be used for all layers which are much thicker than the typical wavelengths of the light that we that you are using. So in this case, it's it's very clear a glass pane of four millimeter thickness is much, much thicker than the light wavelengths that we are considering here. So we have to use this layer type thick layer. Thin film has to be used for layers which are comparable to the wavelengths of light, whose thickness are comparable to the to the uh, wavelengths of light so for everything which is below 10 microns let's say we we should use the object type thin film or some of the other types which may be discussed later on for the glass pane we pick the layer type thick layer generate a new one uh, we can expand the thickness column here a little bit uh, we can change the thickness just by overwriting this number. Place the cursor on this on the cell, type 4, press enter, or ret the return key, and that's it. Code changes the thickness to 4 millimeters. Uh, right now we still have a 4 millimeter layer of vacuum, and we want to change that to glass. Uh, we can do that by drag and drop from the tree view. Glass shows up here in the tree view, 
And if you want to use an object like this in a layer stack, you drag it with the mouse and drop it in the line where you want it to be. You can see from the color already that this is the glass in, in contrast to vacuum. So this is the four millimeter glass that we wanted to have for our first simulation. Okay, now finally, we have to tell Coat or Scout uh, what kind of spectra it should compute. Uh, spectra are collected or managed in the list of spectra, which co also contains a predefined object called R that will serve to compute the reflectance of the glass pane. And this, all these objects here show up as branches in the tree view. If we right click that, we, we will see a graph of the spectrum. And before we do the computation, we have to tell code what it uh, should compute. The spectrum type here is set to reflectance. We could also use transmittance or ATR, that stands for attenuated total reflection. That's an infrared technique. Maybe of interest is the the one here, one minus R minus T. That's one minus the reflectance and transmittance. That's the true absorption of the complete layer stack. Everything which is not reflected and transmitted is absorbed. Well, okay, but here we stick to reflectance. Uh, you have to set the angle of incidence in degrees. Usually spectrometer systems measure at eight degrees, angle of incidence. And if the angle is different from zero, larger than zero, then we, we have to talk about polarization. Uh, that will also be discussed in detail later on. We have to distinguish between S and P polarization and in our case, if we want to compare later on our computation to measured spectra and there is no polarizer used at eight degrees angle of incidence, the best thing here is to assume ideally mixed polarization, which you get if you set here mixed and the polarization option. Okay, uh, finally, we should tell code uh, how detailed the spectrum should be computed. And you can do that in, in the rate using the range command. We should use a spectral range of 300 nanometers to 2,500, let's say with 500 data points. And if we do that, code will execute the computation. And what you see here in blue is the simulated reflectance curve from 300 to 2,500 nanometers. If you want to change the graphics here, which is, uh, well, which, which is uh, sometimes, of course, uh, that's what you want, uh, you can use the command graphics, edit plot parameters, to enter a larger dialog where you can set the settings for the x-axis, the y-axis, you can give the graph a title. Let's call this reflectance. And uh, the x-axis should start at 300 nanometers. And once we have changed this, this is the graph that you see. Uh, actually, there's a graphics tutorial on our website, a text, a PDF that you can get. Uh, explaining all the graphic settings that you can choose. Um, here I don't want to go into further details concerning the graphic settings. Or maybe maybe one detail would be useful. Uh, you can see here the, the grid lines are drawn in red. And uh, later on we will see experiments also in red. So I would like to change this to a kind of gray. Uh, so I will execute the graphics dialog once more, graphics, edit plot parameters, and the colors are used uh, in code or are set in code used so-called pens. Uh, the pens for the uh, grid, the pen for the grid is num pen number two, which is red. 
if we switch if we change that to seven it will be a gray line and that's what we want to have here good that's all for the reflectance spectrum uh, now we have to add a second spectrum the transmittance uh, that's pretty easy in the list of spectra since we know already we have the duplicate command so we can copy the object with all the settings uh, that we have already, we rename the new object from R to T for transmission. We object, we edit the new T object in the tree view, and we set the spectrum type from reflectance to transmittance. Uh, recompute, and uh, now the only thing left is to change the graphic settings, edit plot parameters, and the title should be transmittance instead of reflectance. Okay, so these are the reflectance spectrum and the transmittance spectrum of 4 millimeter float glass. Um, what remains to be done is to show these things in the main view, um, and that's what I will do in the next step. In order to show spectra here in the main view, which we get with F7, we have to visit the list of view elements again, which is here, view, start screen, right mouse click there. Up to now, we just have the two color gradients, uh, the background and the separator color gradient, and uh, to generate a new view element that shows optical an optical spectrum. Um, you can just drag and drop the objects that you want to see to this list. Uh, it's very easy. We take the reflectance spectrum, we drag it to the list of view elements and drop it here. And then you can press F7 to verify that the reflectance spectrum has arrived. Um, we can resize it, move it to the right side where we want to collect the optical spectra. Okay, uh, actually what has happened, if we go back to the list of view elements, code has generated an object of type field view, assigned as source for this object the spectrum uh, R, and this object basically takes the source and uh, draws the graphic of the source, basically the same graphics that we see here, it draws it in the main view so that we will see the reflective spectrum here as a scalable object in the main view. Let's repeat the step for the transmission. Uh, we open the list of view elements, we drag the transmission here, drop it there, and then do the refinement of the positioning here on the right side, uh, on the right side with the shift key and the shift alt key pressed in the main view. So this way we can generate a graph of reflectance and transmittance spectra in the main view. Um, now let's also generate a sketch of the layer stack here in the middle, which is also pretty easy. Open the list of view elements, take the layer stack that you want to see, drag it into the list of view elements press F7 and move it to the position where you want it. Do a resize with Shift Alt pressed at the same time. So now we have the layer stack sketch here in the middle. And uh, on the left side, we still have time, uh, space for some more control elements, some more objects to be displayed. And uh, the next type of object I would like to show you is the list of fit parameters, uh, where we collect all parameters of the optical model that should be flexible, which we want to be able to change uh, either by the mouse or automatically in a fitting procedure. And I would like to show you here uh, some kind of interaction um, with this model by selecting the glass thickness as a parameter uh, that we can easily change with some uh, slider motions so that we can see how the transmission and reflectance of the glass pane um, 
is influenced by the thickness of the pane. So in order to vary a parameter of the model, the easiest way to do that, or the most elegant way, is to go to the tree view, open a list which is called the list of fit parameters, and then in this list of fit parameters, uh, execute the plus command. There is no drop-down box here in this list because there are no, no different uh, types of object. There's just one type which is called fit parameter. And with plus, you can select one of the object, one of the parameters of the optical model to be a flexible fit parameter. Actually, the dialog for the fit parameter selection is pretty large. It shows all the materials with their object parameters, which could be fit parameters or flexible parameters. It shows all the layer stacks and with all the layers of their parameters. And here is the glass thickness that we want to pick now. And in addition, it shows all the parameters of the spectra, like angle of incidence and some more parameters, which will be discussed later and also so-called master parameters. That's a list which, which is em empty at the moment, um, but uh, we could fill it later on also in, in uh, advanced tutorials. First, we just, in this first example, we just pick the glass thickness as a fit parameter. And if I do that, uh, it will get a long name, telling you that it's uh, this object's stack number one, within the stack it's layer number two, filled with the glass, and the parameter is the layer thickness. Um, there's a column called variation, which I will discuss later on. We don't need that at the moment. And very important, each fit parameter can have a low limit and a high limit. If both are zero, that means there is no limitation at all. The parameter can take any value between zero and infinity. Um, if we use limits, uh, we can change the parameter only within those limits. So if we put a 1 for the low limit and, let's say, 20 for the high limit, we can change the thickness of the glass between 1 millimeter and 20 millimeters now. Okay, the digits here determines uh, how much decimals we, we want to see. 1 is maybe enough. For the, for the glass thickness. Um, so now we can uh, display this list of fit parameters also in the, in the view. Um, if we open the list of view elements and drag the whole list of fit parameters there, drop it there, we would get a list view here, and we can move it down a little bit and resize to make it fit into the left part. Well, okay, what you see here is only one fit parameter. Uh, and this is actually showing in this color coding that it has this value between one, which is the lower limit, and 20, which is the upper limit. <clears throat> so you can change the limits by clicking on these little rectangles here. And actually, what is very nice here, you can change the thickness by a mouse motion within the button, uh, within the rectangle here. What you see here now is an, a live update of all the spectra. So in real time, you can go from one millimeter to any value in between one and 20 millimeters and see what happens to the optical spectra. And you will be able to do that with any fit parameter on any selection of fit parameters that you will uh, show here in this list. To finalize this um, first demo example, um, let's add some more materials and some thin films to the layer stack. Let's do that quickly, repeating some of the steps that I showed you. Um, and what I would like to show you in the end here is the setup of a so-called low emission stack, low E stack, 
which requires uh, something like titanium dioxide on glass, followed by a silver layer in the middle and a tin oxide layer on top. So I would, I would now like to show you once more how to go to the optical constant database. We can look for titanium dioxide. Uh, there's a titanium dioxide model uh, here, which we could use. Uh, we have to go to a tin oxide model, which is this one, add it to the list of material, and, and then we also need silver. And then the database, uh, this is my favorite silver model. I will discuss that in another tutorial. Um, actually, the titanium dioxide model, I saw that already in the list, is only computed from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Uh, code uh, should be able to produce also values below 400 and above 1,000, but we have to tell code to do that. So what we can do is we can use the global range command and use the spectral range 300 to 2,500 nanometers with 500 points for all the objects. So now also the titanium dioxide model is computed in this range. We can see all the data. Uh, that's a side remark here by pressing the key A for automatic scaling. So in this case, we see the full range from 300 to 2,500 nanometers and just verify the optical constants are computed in this range. So um, now we can go to the layer stack and generate three new thin films on top of the glass, uh, assign titanium dioxide, silver, and tin oxide. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong drop location. And, uh, well, we can set some typical thickness values, 50 nanometers for the tin oxide, 10 for silver, and let's say 20 for the base, so-called base oxide of this low E stack. And then we go, as a next step, we go to the list of fit parameters and pick the new layer thickness values, which are here, the tin oxide, the silver, and the titanium dioxide. By holding down the control key, you can select several fit parameters uh, in this dialog. By selecting once more, holding down the control key, you can deselect also uh, maybe a wrong selection that you have done. Uh, these three new layer thickness values are also added to as fit parameters here, and we can now uh, use some ranges. Let's say the tin oxide should be varied from 0 to 10, silver layer from 5 to 20 nanometers, and uh, titanium dioxide layer, let's say, from 0 to 40. Now press S7 and verify that you see very different spectra now. These are typical spectra for a low E coating. And uh, if, we, if you change the thickness value, you can see how the spectra also are modified. So this way you can really nicely learn what role each of the, of the model parameters plays in, to the, for the final shape of the optical spectra. Okay, the next step now in this example would be to compute uh, some technical data of the coating, uh, like color values or integral transmission and reflectance values. And uh, we will learn that in, a, in another tutorial uh, for about thin film design. For this tutorial, explaining the user interface, that is now sufficient. And I would like to close and save this configuration using uh, an appropriate file name so that I can refer to it in later tutorials and pick it up again.
Okay, thanks for today.